Welcome back everyone. Today, the plan is to get this little Onan gen set running. This is a 120 volt AC generator set. It's rated at 1000 watts. It's an Onan model 10 LS. I picked this generator up a few weeks ago. It was listed on Craigslist. It was in Philadelphia, which I work a lot in Philadelphia, so I was able to pick it up on my way home from a job, which was very handy. So, this video is going to be similar to the last Onan Gen Set video, which, if you can kind of see it, it's probably right down there. That was the 305 CK Gen Set. I want to do something similar to, to that video, where we get the unit running, we test it under load, and determine whether or not it needs any further repair, um, and is it if it does need further repair, is does the unit is the unit worth doing further repair on? I want to try to make this video more informative than the last video, especially for those of you that are interested in picking up an old piece of equipment, whether it be a generator or a tractor or a pump, anything really and are unsure of what to look for when, when buying a piece, buying an old machine, whether or not you're, you're getting your value, getting your money's worth, and at what point you have to just walk away and say, you know, this is either too much of a project for, for yourself to handle at the time, or in this case, you know, for myself to handle at the time, or you would end up so far uh, in the hole financially with the project that it, uh, it didn't make sense to, to carry it out. Now, for some people, money is no object working on these things. Uh, case in point is the big cat generator that I'm working on. That unit, by the time I'm done, uh, I, I would have, will likely have more in it than I could get out of it if I wanted to sell it. Thing is, I don't want to sell it. The big cat generator is the kind of project that it doesn't matter what it costs to fix and get running. I just want it to run, and I want to keep it as a collect collectible piece. This unit I purchased really as a fun little project. Take it apart, see what ails it, get it running, and eventually probably sell it. Not, not looking to make a profit where I sell it so much so as just I'm looking to, the, my, the profit is going to be in the entertainment value of getting the unit running and making this video. So, I'm going to uh, cut the video here, and I want to take you and show you the little cart that this unit came on. Well, that it, that it was on when I purchased it. So, let's cut that video now. Okay, sorry about the wind noise. I'm trying to block it as best I can. This is the little cart that the Onan 10LS uh, was installed on when I purchased it. I don't really know the, the the history of this little cart. It it looks like a combination of uh, factory built and with some home built uh, homemade accessories. The the exhaust system here is obviously not not original. It looks like it's two glass packs in series uh, to try to to silence it a little bit. Can pull that out of here. The fuel tank. I don't know what the deal is with that. It's interesting that it has it has this little relief that's been stamped into it and a kind of a lousy paint job, but it's got this little relief that's stamped into it. And when the unit sits on this cart, this relief is actually necessary because the end bell of the generator would, would contact the tank otherwise. And what is this? Is this Cadillac? Cadillac gas cap? It's very interesting. It's heavy as hell. A little bit of liquid left in there. Let me turn it up. You can see the bottom, the the axle and the supports are a casting. Dripping a little bit of fuel there. It's kind of an interesting setup, but it's got like a, a flat plate bar stock welded frame, so it's interesting. It could be cleaned up and uh, made to be serviceable. Little battery tray here. Seen better days. Well, let's go back inside and uh, get to work on the gen set. Okay, let's get back to the things that I look for when I buy a, a project like this, a used piece of equipment. Something that's typically antique. It's got a lot of years behind it. 
The first thing I look for is the presence of a data plate or a tag. Something that's going to tell me who made the unit, where the unit was made, what model it is, and what its ratings are. In this case, we have that. It's an Onan model 10LS, 1000 watt, 120 volt AC generator. Okay, that's the first check off the list. Then I'll start looking the unit over and seeing if, if it's an engine, seeing if there's a way that I can turn the engine, turn it over, see that it does turn over and that it's not locked up. Now, people have varying opinions on whether or not you should rotate a piece of machinery like this, especially something that you don't own, um, because you can cause internal damage to the gen set. Depending on the, or I shouldn't say gen set, depending on the piece, depending on how it's constructed internally, if this unit had a valve that was rusted shut, stuck down, and you came over and turned the flywheel, and went, were a little bit excessive, depending on the internal construction, you could say either bend a valve stem, bend a, bend a tap it, or break the camshaft, or break a tooth on the cam. Now, you kind of have to use your judgment. If you can rotate the engine freely, feel a little bit of drag, that's normal, especially with something that's been sitting a while. You don't want to go crazy, you know, maybe a quarter turn back and forth, that's about it. If it turns and you feel a little bit of drag, that's good. If you feel no drag, well, that could be a good or bad. So, data tag, make sure the thing turns over. Now, if I, I forgot to mention, if the data tag isn't present or if it doesn't turn over, that's, that is not necessarily a reason not to buy the piece of equipment. I've bought many things that did not spin or that were locked up tight. And a case in point, the cat gen set again. Now, I've also bought things that were missing the tag. I tried not, not to do that very often. Having the data tag is very important for me. But, all those two things aside, next thing I look at is how complete the unit is overall. If it's, you know, take this one for example. Does it have the, the rope starter cup on the front of the flywheel? You might not be able to see that from where you're at. Does it have the air filter? Does it have the carburetor? Does it have the fuel pump? Is the sediment bowl for the fuel pump there? Does it have an exhaust system? Uh, obviously, I, I cut that exhaust system off here. Um, in case like this, various accessories like the, the thermostatic governor here. That moves. Ignition, what's that look like? This one has a replacement wire on it, which is actually coming out of the wrong location. Um, this hole, I believe, should be just plugged, and the spark plug lead should come out here. Um, being this is an electric start model. Uh, things like, is the, the amp meter glass cracked? The charge rate control knob, is that there? Does the governor linkage move freely? Is the governor linkage complete? Is the carburetor original? Things like that. Little accessories like the fuel fill, the fuel cap, or not, <laughs> the oil fill and the oil cap. Um, looking over the unit further, let me take you off the tripod here. Various cast components like the end bell, is that in one piece, is it broken out, are things missing on it? I didn't notice this when I first looked at it. See there's a little, a little piece of cast miss, missing from this cover. Not the end of the world. Then when you move on to the internals of the generator and the controls, what's that look like? Is there a mouse nest in there? Is there corrosion? This eh, looks like it looks like it was sitting in a damp place for a while. There's no no serious corrosion, no real evidence of mouse intrusion. It's really not that bad overall. Just a little dirty. Has it been repainted? This unit has a time or two. Looks like we got green paint over some yellow paint. It was probably a very dark green originally. Here's that rope starter sheave. Now one thing I also didn't notice when I bought the unit, wasn't taking my own advice, is you got some welds here. So looks like this cast iron uh, sheave for the rope must have split at some point. This bolt also does not look original. Here's that important data plate that I mentioned earlier. If it's a gen set, what's the condition of the exterior of the generator? Does it have a receptacle or any kind of wiring attached to it? 
one thing I should have mentioned earlier, if it is a gen set, you, again, you only want to turn the unit about a quarter turn in either direction. Um, in case you got a brush that's dragging or anything hung up in the generator end. Overall, that's about it. Really, I look for units that are pretty well complete. I don't, I don't like to buy things that are missing a lot of parts. If the engine's locked up or it has some, some generator issue, burned up wiring, I don't mind that so much as missing parts. Is it, if you needed to locate this air filter or this air, or this air intake elbow or odd little things like that, this intake combination intake exhaust adapter, a cylinder head, if you had cracked or chipped fins on the cylinder head, missing generator uh, end belt cover, those kind of things would make me not buy the unit. Just, I, I would spend more time and, and money and I'd probably have to buy a whole nother gen set to get the part I was missing. It's very unlikely you're going to find just this intake exhaust component laying on a table at a swap meet somewhere. You'd probably find a whole nother unit and if you got lucky it would have this part but it would be missing another part. Some people don't mind doing that. Some people don't mind the hunt for parts. I, I don't typically care for that. I used to do it. I used to buy a thing missing parts and either make the parts or um, or spend time trying to find them, but I find that I, I don't have the time to do that anymore. I want something that's complete that I can repair and then operate. So let's get into the teardown and the serious um, analysis of this unit and determine what it's going to need to be running again. Alright, now the fellow that sold me this generator told me that he thinks it'll run without too much difficulty, but the spark is weak. So, we're going to have to, that's going to be a bit of a pain, isn't it? We're going to have to get the engine to turn over freely, pull the flywheel off, and inspect the ignition points, test the condenser and all that, try to determine why it doesn't have any spark. Now, being a generator, I'm going to block your view for a sec here. Being a generator, I want to remove the brushes or, or lift the brushes off of the slip rings and the commutator before I go spinning it around excessively. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't want to score up anything in the generator end. Let's take you off the stand and take a look in there. A little dark and dirty, but normal. Don't have any fins broken off of the generator cooling fan here. That's a plus. Just typically, just pop the brushes out, set the spring back in the brush holder, let the brushes dangle there. That one might be a bit of a pain. I think I'll have to get a little pick or a hook to get that spring off. And then you got the ones on the DC commutator here, kind of hiding. Let me pull those off and then we'll move over to taking the uh, fan shroud off. Alright, now I should just say lifting those brushes off the slip rings in the commutator can be a bit of an exercise in patience, but it's definitely worth it to avoid damaging anything. So what I'm going to do is pull off this air filter assembly. Shouldn't be too difficult. This whole thing is kind of loosely assembled anyway. Spark plug out, see what that looks like in there. Carefully, you don't chip any of these fins here. Yeah. Looks like that didn't do too much running. Well, the guy did say he couldn't get spark out of it. Got a Healy coil in the spark plug uh, hole there or thread repair. 
thread repair insert. Quite a number of uh, fasteners missing from this thing. A little mismatched looking as well. It's not the end of the world. Almost looks like that shroud's meant to be able to be, or it's meant to be lifted straight off. But this big uh, cast uh, piece here is in the way. Just take the bolt all the way out. Side of the shroud is nice. Engine turns turns through without any issue. Feels smooth. Good compression too. Let's throw the spark plug back in just for the heck of it. This is the first time I've actually spun this engine over all the way. Wow. That's excellent compression. Very good. You know, looking at those brushes, I didn't show this, but they look like they are they have either been replaced or they have very little running hours on them because they're they're almost the full length they would be if they were new. Just for the hell of it, let's just see what the spark looks like. anything there. Okay, well, one thing we might try first is look at the kill wire here. I'm going to disconnect that. Let's see where that's going real quick. down there to terminal number two. Let's see if I can disconnect that. Pull that wire out. Now that the magneto is ungrounded, let's see if we have spark now. Just to make sure it isn't something foolish. Like, uh, or not foolish, but something in the control wiring that's giving us no spark. Nope, 
Still nothing. All right, let's get that flywheel off. I gotta get 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 a few more tools, and we'll be back in. A okay, let's see about taking this flywheel off. Got a five sixteenths Allen bolt here. Allen screw. Take a closer look at that repair on the rope sheave here. A couple of weld beads there. And on the back. It did a nice job. Yeah, I don't mind that at all. Just a repair. Happens. Put the bolt back in. Most, most of the way. Won't tighten it, of course. Back it out a few turns. screwdriver in behind the flywheel just to put a little bit of what I'm doing is putting the, the blade of the screwdriver in this gap here and I'm rotating it trying to rotate the screwdriver that's drawing the end play out of the crankshaft in this direction so then what I'm going to do is strike the head of this bolt with the brass hammer here that should dislodge the flywheel off of its taper on the crank should take more than a few taps I feel like it's loose. The bolt's still loose. I feel like it hopped off there. There it is. Back side of the flywheel. Magnets. Ooh, they feel pretty weak. That's not a great sign. Take a look at the hub. Hub of the flywheel, it doesn't look like it's cracked. Looks like it's had a little trauma in the past. Right there. Feels okay. Take a look at the taper on the generator on the crankshaft. Oh boy, definitely some trauma there. Look at that. Wow. What happened to this thing? Wow, it's like somebody put a pair of pliers on it or something. That's not great. We'll have to dress that up with a, with a file. Take those high spots off. Hmm. Let's take a close look at the magneto now. Our coil. Spark plug lead. Our ground wires. Going up to a screw there for the condenser. Our primary lead, primary winding lead, going to the points and condenser there. Take a close look at the points, they're open right now. Alright, I'm going to take all this apart here, Oops, sorry, take the condenser off, take the points off, isolate the wiring for the coil, we'll test the coil, test the condenser, and clean the points, see if we can get spark out. All right, now the uh, points have been removed. Let's we can take a closer look at the contacts. Okay, the stationary and the movable point here. They look good. They've, they've got corrosion and dirt on them, of course, but uh, they should clean up just fine. Let's use the meter here and check the primary and secondary coil resistance. The primary and secondary coils one end of each coil terminates here and this uh, is grounded to the uh, engine frame. We'll check the primary first. You see the meter still? Yeah. Okay. Good idea to check your lead resistance first.
Yeah. About what I expect. Pretty much pretty much no resistance or very, very low resistance to the primary coil. And then we'll check the secondary coil. Keep one lead on the ground and put the other lead on the end of the spark plug wire. Kind of hook it in there. Uh, 6.8 K. So 6,800 ohms. That sounds about right. Anything in the, in, in my experience with small engines, anything in the the 5 to 8,000 ohm range for a small magneto coil like this is typically just fine. Uh, you know what, while we're here, let's take a look at that condenser. Almost forgot about that. Meter has a handy capacitance function on it. Can you see that display? Yep. Set the condenser down here. You know what, let's short it out. I'm sure it doesn't have any kind of charge in it, but it never hurts to short it out. Is that 0.9 microfarad? 800 nanofarad, well, 0.8 nanofarad. Yeah, it should be 0.2 microfarad, so that's shot. That's way out of spec. So, let's uh, go ahead and clean the points up, and we'll work on figuring out how we can put a new condenser in there, because I do not think I have one in this, this uh, you know, package size with this mounting flange and the threaded stud. Gonna have to get creative there. All right, here's a look at our reassembled magneto. The points are reinstalled and gapped to 18 thousandths. I cleaned up the taper on the nose of the crank here. Just took the high spots off. I don't know what, what in the heck could have caused the, the divots in there, but they're cleaned up now. Replaced the condenser. I have a whole slew of these, uh, you know, universal, uh, 0.22 microfarad uh, condensers, capacitors, whatever you want to call them. And I made a little strap out of uh, copper, sheet copper, to hold it in there. Uh, in lieu of the stud that the old condenser had, that stud right there, I just took the, the one lead from the new condenser, heat shrinked it, brought it over with the terminal, and used a little screw, a number six screw and a nut to kind of cinch all those leads together and it kind of just it it floats right here it's not d directly attached to anything let me take you off the tripod here uh, however I'm not all that concerned with that as this this copper strap right here is, is fairly rigid and it it seems to hold everything in place if it becomes a problem I'll know where to look first but it's all it's all pretty well situated in there so let's go ahead and slap the flywheel back on it and see if we get some spark. It should be an easy enough task. I'll leave you turned on for that. Inside of the flywheel is pretty clean. A little bit of like grass and debris. It looks like like this thing was this thing was stored in like a barn in Philadelphia, if you can believe that. So, a little bit of debris in there, nothing serious. It seems to seat nicely, so I don't think the either the, the flywheel or the crank nose were damaged by that. Those, uh, like, little pop marks in the nose of the crank. Just take that, give that thing a little tighten. Not too tight. Don't don't know if we have spark yet. We might have to take it back off. Raise you up here. See if that'll stay there for me.
Oh boy. I knew that wasn't gonna stay. Let's see if we get anything. Oh, I can hear it. I can see it too. It looks pretty good. Definitely, definitely accept uh, acceptable. That'll run an engine. Okay. Well, step one accomplished. We got spark. Let me tighten that flywheel bolt up fully. And then I think, I think we're going to take a look at the generator end and the electrical aspect. Oh, you know what? No. One thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of this video, when you're checking out a unit that you want to purchase, look and see what the oil looks like. I can't believe I forgot to mention that. We're going to put the blower housing back on and we're going to pull this plug here, stick a screwdriver or something down in the bottom of the pan, see what the, what the uh, oil looks like, see if it's sludgy or what. It should be fairly easy to pull this bottom pan on this unit if I have to. So let's do that now. Okay, well I've loosened up the oil drain plug, or sorry, this is the fill plug already. Let's go down there and reach around and see what we find. If we find any sludge down in the bottom of the pan. I'm sure we're going to find some sludge. Hmm. Yeah, I saw a couple chunks fall off. Yeah, I think I think there may have been some water getting in here. From what I can see. Being this engine does have an oil pump and no real way to gauge the pressure that's the oil pressure that's being built. I think it would uh it's going to be uh, in the best interests of this thing to go ahead and pull this uh, sump plate off and take a look inside there. So, didn't plan on doing that, but I think it's a course of action worth taking at this point. All right, down. Okay, I've loosened up all the, well, the four pan bolts. I laid a piece of cardboard down because this is probably gonna get messy. Note that they have copper ceiling washers on the bolts. Drained out as much oil as I uh, had the patience to wait to drain out. So, probably going to be a bit remaining in there. It's already leaking out now. I believe that's it, just the four. Looks like it. bad. There's a rag you need one. There you go. Alright. Let's take a look in there. Bring it down. So you can see what I can see. Pretty nice in there, actually. Check out the sludge and grit in the pan, though. Yeah, wise choice to remove this pan, I would say. That's good. Simple gasket, rectangle with four bolt holes. Get a closer look in here. You know, now that we're this far in, I'm tempted to pull the connecting rod cap and take a look at the uh, rod bearings. Sounds like the oil pump's working. 
you know what? I think that's the fuel pump I'm hearing. <laughs> Maybe we'll pull that oil pump off. Just make sure the check balls and everything are free in it. Okay, here's our oil pump and our oil pump push rod. We've never taken one of these apart before, so kind of experiencing this together. A little piston. So we've got a spring down there. Get that out. Nope, oh, doesn't really seem to want to come out. See what I can see down there. A little flashlight. Looks like I see one check ball, and I imagine there's another one under this fitting, captive by that pin. What's a custom? Uh, Got two inverted flares and a quarter inch pipe thread and an eighth inch pipe thread coming out the side. That's a custom fitting if I ever saw one. Let me soak this, see if I can get them check balls freed up without having to remove everything here. I think, just to test that it's working, I'll put this in a little tray of fuel oil and actuate the pump and see if we get flow. Let's try that. Okay, let's do our simple oil pump test. If I didn't mention it already, this is the uh, the pressure relief valve. It's adjustable, of course. So we're not going to mess with that if we don't have to. Take a little plunger here. See. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. I'd say that works very well. I think I'll leave it soaking for a little while longer. Loosen up any uh, sludge that's in there. Actuate it a few more times to flush it out. And we're going to be ready to put it back together and put the base back. Alright. New base gasket here, and a new gasket for the oil filler, which goes on this side, and we'll get this put back together. Okay, we're upright again, as you can see. We're full of fresh SAE 30 non-detergent uh, engine oil, and it's time to proceed to the electrical end of this little generator. Before I do that, I'd like to speak briefly about safety regarding uh, working on generators or generators or any kind of electrical equipment. Uh, this, this unit here has the potential to kill you electrically if the, uh, if the right situation, uh, that is the wrong situation occurs and you place the output of this generator across your heart, uh, it will kill you. So bear that in mind when working with uh, any kind of electrical equipment, uh, anything above, uh, you know, what is it? I think, you know, 50 volts AC uh, or uh, 60 or 70 volts DC. Be very, very careful. Um, and even even lower voltages can be dangerous. It can uh, lead to, uh, you know, arcs and sparks, which can blind you and burn you and things like that. So, really. Moving along with this one, I want to tear into this control box just to um, verify that there's nothing that's going to short out, go wrong, or pose a hazard to myself or anybody else that happens to be happens to work on this generator in the future or anything like that. So, I'm going to start off with uh, removing this receptacle here, which I don't think is a it's, this is not an original attachment. It's just a junction box somebody bolted onto the side here. So uh, one thing that uh, you have to realize about these old units is the, the neutral is grounded. And if I'm not mistaken, well no, you, you could isolate the neutral from the ground if you, if you had a mind to, but typically they're set up where 
the neutral is the grounded conductor and the hot is the ungrounded conductor. Well, this is a, a polarized receptacle and I've seen a number of times where people will put the grounded conductor on the line side or the, or the ungrounded side and vice versa. So we want to take this receptacle off and follow the wires back and see where they are terminated uh, below the control box or below the relay panel here and make sure that the, the hot is actually the hot and the neutral is actually the grounded neutral. So let me pause you while I disassemble the side panels and take this receptacle off. Okay, here's a look at the, whatever you'd like to call this, the relay block. Lift it out, take a look underneath. Dirty, but looks pretty serviceable. I haven't seen any nicked wires or anything that looks like it was a hot connection or anything like that. A couple condensers under there. We're going to have to determine what their function is to see if we can uh, eliminate them out of the circuit. If you remember the last video, the last Onan generator, I disconnected all the unnecessary electrolytic capacitors that were in there, um, including one here, filter capacitors, uh, as they have a tendency to burst and leak uh, after, <laughs> after they've gotten to a certain the age and you put you put power to them, they will tend to burst and make a big mess. But anyway, like I was saying earlier about, uh, uh, you know, receptacle polarization and uh, uh, the grounded conductor and the ungrounded conductor, I'm certainly glad I did this. Uh, I marked, this is the lead that was going to the hot side of the receptacle, marked it with a black line there, and sure enough, that's the grounded wire, the wire that they have grounded. So that, that could have been very bad uh, if somebody was to use a, um, you know, one of those old radios or toasters where the chassis is, is bonded to ground. Well, in that case, if somebody would have plugged it into this, uh, the chassis would have been at, uh, it would have been ungrounded, essentially. So it would have been at potential. Uh, above ground potential and if you were to touch the chassis and your your feet were grounded or your other arm was grounded that that could have that could have really killed somebody to be honest with you so I'm gonna have to get that changed out and just remember that for the future everybody so what are we gonna do here I'm gonna clean all this up and trace out the wiring for those condensers looks like the one here is across the flicker points which are up front we learned about those uh, last year with the small, I think the PE88 Onan had a set of flicker points. We'll take a look at them again in a minute. And uh, other than that, I think, uh, I think we're good. So let's continue on. Okay, now that we're in the middle of the electrical assessment or repair for this unit, I thought I'd bring a little new technology in here and show everybody the uh, where I find uh, all the manuals for these old Onan generators. So, here's the, uh, I guess, there's the site. And it, this, uh, this is like a ham radio operator site, something along those lines, but they have also compiled an enormous list of Onan operators, parts, and service manuals for nearly every Onan model, Onan genset model that has been produced. And you can just see how long this list is. And I'm, uh, I don't mean just generators, I mean transfer switches and switch gear and controls and everything. So it's, it's quite an amazing thing. It's all free, of course. You just click on it and it opens up. So where, let's go up a little bit further, oh, there we go, so they've got, we, this is the model 10LS, they've got the service and parts manual, and then 1B, spec A through C, operator and service manual, 
and one BAC DC genset instruction manual. So this this unit is the 10LS model, but the engine is a 1B series engine. So you can kind of use whatever uh, e e any of those three manuals to find the information you need. And even though they are they are similar, these manuals they they each contain a little bit uh, slightly different uh, information. So and. and so you may have to open up one or two manuals of, the, of a similar model t to find all the information you need. So, for example, here is the wiring schematic for this unit. We're going to go through that in a second. But here is parts, parts breakdown. And these are all scanned images, so some may be better than the other. That's another reason why you have to um, kind of search around through the different manuals to figure out which one which one has the best image for you to look at. Parts, parts, parts. Parts and prices. Not that you could uh, call up Cummins today and buy any of those, but it might help to search eBay and things like that. You never know what comes up there. There's uh, magneto information, oil pump information, governor adjustment, and they go through just the the, the uh, typical things an operator might need to know with the generator set. Up at the top, there's installation instructions. There you go. Pretty cool to see uh, how they recommended uh, these things be installed back in the 40s and 50s. Anyway, we're interested in the wiring diagram right now. Now, I, I want to bring this up because there was a lot of controversy in my last Odin video, it seems, regarding whether or not these gen sets were positive or negative ground. And uh, according to the schematic the diagram for this unit and for the other unit, the old uh, CK there, the 305 CK, uh, they are in fact negative ground. And they show two 6 volt batteries in series for a 12 volt system. And sure enough, the negative is ground frame ground. So these units were all negative ground. I'm not aware of any Onan gen set that's ever been positive ground. That's not to say that they didn't exist, but at least these smaller units were all negative ground. So let's see. What we really want to determine is what the function of the two condensers are. This one here and this one here on the DC section. This one down here looks like it's across the flicker points just to uh, help quell the arc out there that the flicker points are located under this cover and where are they oh there they are so there's the resistance let me move the image up a little bit so there's the flicker points this terminal here is kind of just a tie point I'll show you that here in a sec. There's the uh, ceramic resistor to select the resistance for the field. And there's the line going to that one condenser and that goes to ground. So it's pretty much just, uh, and the, the flicker points go to ground as well. So it's, it almost serves the function, the same function as the ignition condenser, just to help prevent arcing at the flicker points. And then the other condenser, right there, 0.1 microfarad. That's between the, looks like the stop contact, which is interesting. So we got the start and stop button here. This is what's located on the plant. This would be these two buttons right here. And then, yeah, that condenser is between number two, number two and number one. And number two is stop, and number one is ground. So again, I, I imagine that's just for uh, kind of quenching of the arc that's produced when you release that stop button. Interesting that there's not one on the start button as well, but depending on depending on so the start button only has to deal with that coil right there in the start relay. So I imagine when you release the start button that coil 
doesn't, I don't know, but must not pass very much current, so they're not worried about the arc that's generated when you break the circuit. Whereas the stop button, let's see where that's doing. The stop button is, well, it's obviously grounding out the magneto, but what else is it doing? That looks like it. It looks like it just grounds out the magneto. So they wanted an extra an extra capacitance across that and ground. And there's a filter filter choke right there, which that should be this little guy on this little wooden spool. All right. Well, we're going to leave those two condensers in play. The other two on the uh, on the AC output, I've clipped the clipped the leads, but I've left, left left the condensers in place. They would be. Let's see. They would be this one right here. See, this brush and this one here. Those are the two brushes on the slip rings. So you've got one. That's the grounded or the uh, the neutral slash grounded leg right there, that brush. If you follow the lead, oops, sorry, kind of bounces over, and they call that the white or a grounded conductor. That's M2, AC main lines. The black conductor, M1, is the ungrounded conductor over here, which does have a condenser across it going to ground, and I believe they're both... 0.1 microfarad. I could be wrong. Looks like they've got one up at a 0.1 across this point here. This is one of the, uh, the field brushes, and then another one a 0.5 there. They don't give you the spec for that one. It's interesting. Anyway, well, I think I hope that's helpful to, uh, to some folks out there. There's another diagram. This is for a DC plant. Yep. 32 volt plant. Pretty helpful. Let me flip this back around. Oh, I think I broke it. Oh, it's upside down now. Some troubleshooting information there. All right, let me reassemble the uh, electrical end of this, and we'll proceed on to the fuel system. Okay, one more thing before we move on. Got the brushes reinstalled. Also, cleaned up the slip rings and the commutator. I just used a piece of uh, this my kind of uh, brownish maroon colored, uh, I guess it's maroon really, uh, Scotch-Brite. And typically, uh, on a hard to access unit like this, There'll be a spot where you can just about get the scotch bright in there, and then I just turn the engine over by hand. Uh, just one, two, three, four, five, six, however many time, times it takes to get a good, a good uh, bright surface on the slip rings and the commutator bars, which you can't even really see. The commutator bars are kind of hard to access there. But get a good bright finish, get all the corrosion and dark spots off. Um, after uh, you know normal running, you will get the uh, kind of the darkened areas on, on the slip rings and the commutator bars. That's fine. That's natural, uh, you know, from deposition from the brushes. So perfectly normal. Also replace the uh, the main AC output wires. So these are 14 gauge. Uh, they're kind of got like a fiberglass uh, cloth braided insulation. So they're going to be perfect. Reinstalled the original receptacle, so I'm going to put the cover back on here and we'll pull the carburetor. Alright, so the carburetor's been removed, disassembled, it's not that bad on the inside, a little bit of uh, dirt and grit. I'm going to take the whole thing, all the bits and pieces, and uh, put them in one of these uh, carburetor dip buckets. I know people have some varying opinions on the effectiveness of these things, but I find them to be effective, so I'm just going to let that sit for a little while. And in the meantime, let's uh, con continue on, and we're going to pull off the uh, 
flicker point assembly, which is also the tappet cover. And we're going to check the adjustment of the tappets. All right, let's go ahead and pull this off of here. tight. And the whole stud's coming out. Okay. Fair enough. Sorry about that. This has been off a timer too. Look at all that silicone. Wow. Jeez. Okay. Now there's the push rod for the flicker points there. It's like a phenolic. Feels like feels almost like the uh, points push rod in an old Briggs engine. Wow. Look at all the silicone. Oh my gosh. Okay then. Let's get you off there and take a peek. Now that's an interesting setup. Like I said, I've not been in one of these engines before, so. That is pretty interesting. Let's uh, let's rotate it. Rotate the engine here. I might have to look at the manual to uh, figure out this adjustment procedure. Looks like we got the uh, followers followers there riding on the cam. We got a, a bolt with a slot cut in that plate. Very interesting. Let me take a look at this and we'll come back in a sec. Well, it looks like I got a bit ahead of myself. Got the governor linkage cleaned up, put back on. Flicker points are cleaned up, reinstalled and adjusted. Of course, the tappet covers back on. Now, I adjusted those tappets off camera because it would have been kind of a pain, kind of a bit of, uh, kind of a pain to show you exactly what I was doing in there. But I made a little drawing here to try to illustrate uh, how exactly that, that adjustment system worked. So, here's the camshaft and the cam lobe. This is the valve stem. And this is a, uh, like the pivot rod where you saw that uh, 716's bolt kind of hanging down below. Now, there's a, an arrangement of pieces of stamped steel that are acting as the, the, the tappet or the lever arm to actually raise the valve stem. Now, the, I guess the angle between the part that contacts the valve stem and the, the part that contacts the cam, obviously it's, it's an acute angle here if you were to follow that back. So as you pull the whole assembly out, you decrease the uh, valve clearance because the distance between the two points increases. So then you just use a feeler gauge between the, uh, the lower part and the uh, camshaft and you cinch it down with that one bolt. So pretty simple. Very interesting setup though. There's your clearance specs. So they, they weren't out too far. They were a little excessive, but only maybe by a thousandth or two. So let me put you on the stand. Well, here's the carburetor. I'll show you that. That's cleaned up, put back together. Made a cork gasket here. The original was a paper gasket, but 
oftentimes I'll use a cork gasket on these because they, they have a, a very common problem where the top cover here will warp. It will actually, now let me, let me put you up on the tripod so I can work with two hands here. So because the cover only has two screws holding it down, the pop metal over time will actually warp and bend and these corners will get pulled down and you'll end up with a with a large gap in the opposite corners. So I spent some time with a file trying to flatten out this top cover and I got it pretty close but I, then I used a cork gasket to kind of take up the excess clearance that would have been here and here you can see there's still a little bit of clearance there but it's about all I could do with it. It should seal pretty well. Another thing I noticed is that the throttle shaft the throttle shaft is a bit worn. I keep going out of, can of a frame there. A little sloppy. But I'm not going to worry about that initially. We'll see how it runs. I had to make a new plug down here for the uh, one of the main jets. But let's hang this back on. Interesting. Another thing to note, it looks like uh, at some point somebody stripped out uh, the quarter inch threads that were in this hole and they, they may have done it on here but then it was re-threaded. It's, it's odd. There's a 5 16 thread here and there was just there's no threads in this ear and there was just a nut under there. So I don't know what the history behind that is but I'm not going to worry about it right now. Made a new gasket here. Let me just... I was going to make a new piece of fuel line but the inside is pretty clean even though the outside's rusty and ugly but not going to worry about that now either. We just want to see if this thing's going to run. Even though we've kind of spent spent a lot of uh, time on this unit already just to see if it's going to run. But seems that seems you guys like the longer videos. I know when I watch videos on YouTube, I prefer the longer, longer videos people put up, rather than just a short, uh, short clip. Yeah, I, I prefer a longer video myself than, uh, you know, thirty short videos. But that's just me. After we get the carburetor mounted, we'll do a little uh, a little coarse valve adjustment, or not valve adjustment, governor adjustment. We'll get that uh, get that set before we actually go out and try to run the engine. The only thing I have to do after the uh, after mounting the carburetor and before running it is make a new gasket for the sediment bowl. A little bit of a challenge to get that nut under there. Second seven sixteenths wrench here. Let me move you over. Let me pause you while I go grab a second 716. Okay. So it's a bit of a pain to get a second wrench in here.
All right, let's bring you over here. See if I can show you the basic governor adjustment procedure. Eh, it might be a little bit difficult. All right, I think that's the best uh, angle I'm going to be able to give you. So can you see the relationship here between the throttle shaft on the carburetor and the governor shaft here? Now, this pin runs down the gear case and the cam gear is sitting under this cover. The cam gear has the flyweights for the governor built into it. So, and those flyweights act on a paddle, as it's called, under this cover that's attached to this little rod, I should say, this rod that runs up through here. And at the moment, the governor arm is not clamped to that rod. See, that rod only moves a little bit right there. So when the rod, when the governor rod is turned fully counter, or sorry, fully clockwise, the paddle is depressing the flyweights on the governor. So the flyweights are closed. They're not, they're not flying out at speed. They're, they're being pushed closed. Now at that position, you want the, uh, the throttle butterfly, the throttle shaft in the carburetor to be at wide open throttle, which is this position. See the spring that's under here is always trying to pull the throttle to wide open. So we've got nice free movement, no binding there. So we'll let that go to wide open throttle and hold the, the rod, the shaft, fully clockwise. Now at this point, I'm going to release that. Take my two seven sixteenths wrenches again and clamp the throttle arm onto that shaft, observing the relationship between the the, sh the shaft and the arm to, just to make sure that they don't move. Oop, just slid down there. that didn't shift on me. Okay. And tighten it the rest of the way. Okay. Now, like I said in the last Onan video, I always back the governor tension out quite a ways. Not quite that far, though. <laughs> That's a little too slow. A little too loose. There. That's good. So that should, that should at least get me to a point where it's going to run. It's probably going to run too slow, but that's not a problem. I'd have it, rather, rather have it run too slow and have to speed it up than run too quick and over speed. Or in this case, go over voltage as well, because on these, these old self-excited generators or self-regulated generators or inherently regulated generators, whatever you want to call them, uh, voltage is directly related to engine speed. So real quick, here's a top view of what I was doing there. This shaft has a screw slot in it, and the governor lever itself pinches to grip that shaft. So we got two adjustments here. We've got your speed adjustment. There's a spring down there. Can you see that? And then you got your sensitivity adjustment, which is this screw right here. Now, backing that in, or threading it in, or backing it out, changes the, the geometry of the governor, and it changes the effective tension of that spring, which uh, controls the sensitivity of the governor. We'll get into that a little bit later once we get the thing running. So the only thing I gotta do now is put the air filter back on, sediment bowl, pop a muffler on it, and we'll get this thing running. All right, it's time for the first official start. Got a muffler on there, got the fuel hooked up, got a tank, tank down on the ground there. Got a starting battery behind the unit. This uh, 
This fuel pump actually has a priming lever, which is a nice feature. See that? There's our fuel. Now I'm curious to see where this thing starts leaking fuel at. I'm sure it's going to seep a little bit. Not the end of the world. We get a meter put in here. Okay. You know what? I see one thing I missed. Cotter pin for the throttle linkage. Give me a sec. Okay, here we go. First start. Let's see what she does. spring in there like a clockwork spring. As the exhaust heats up, there's a shaft that runs down this pipe. That little lever you see jittering around down there. That's a manual override of the choke. So it may run pretty uh, pretty poorly like this until that choke opens up. Oh, man, sorry about the wind. 
that noise? Let's see if the battery's charging. fuel. Let's see if it'll restart. Batter's 
charging. So let's conclude this video. We started out wanting to know what the condition of this generator was. Was it worth putting any serious time and effort into? Now we spent we spent a solid day here. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but to do everything you saw took me the entire day. Um, there's a couple things with the carburetor you didn't get to, get to see. I jumped around a little bit, but I tried to get uh, tried to get you a shot of everything. So the answer is yes. I'd say that this generator would be worth either fully restoring uh, or just doing a more thorough mechanical restoration. Get this throttle shaft uh, tightened back out, put some bushings in it, tighten this governor linkage up, give it a paint job. Other than that, I can't really think of anything else it needs. It has great compression, it seems to run under load pretty well. But it was a pretty good investment for 50 bucks. It's a good little generator. Well, I hope you found this video useful, uh, at least those of you that uh, you know are thinking about starting little projects like this, thinking about getting into the hobby. So, if you did enjoy it, uh, please consider uh, supporting this channel and myself and my projects on Patreon. I just opened a Patreon account. I would certainly appreciate any donations. They would all go to the shop here, uh, especially getting toward getting the cat done, getting little projects like this done. So uh, thank you for watching and have a good night.